seniors and what tax time means for them. Oftentimes seniors believe that since they are no longer actively working or active in their careers that their taxes become much more simple and nothing could be further from the truth than that. Seniors are oftentimes the most problematic of taxpayers and because their circumstances have radically changed from their active working years, their tax situations become far more complicated. We're going to take a look at some of the issues that our seniors are facing today and I hope you will find today's presentation of value to you and your seniors. As Erica said, my name is Bianna Whitlock. I am an enrolled agent. An enrolled agent is someone that has passed an examination with the U.S. Department of Treasury. I am actually allowed not only to prepare tax returns, but I am also able to fully represent taxpayers before all administrative levels of the Internal Revenue Service. This is my 45th tax filing season. I've seen a lot of changes in the tax system in the last 45 years, but because I'm becoming one of these senior taxpayers, I know that for me tax time is problematic and we want to reduce the stress for our seniors. The first thing that a senior always wants to ask is do I really need to file a tax return? And of course in 2012 we're looking at the filing of a tax return for 2011. If your senior is single, then they have not only their personal exemption amount for 2011, which is $3,700, but they also have a standard deduction. That is $5,800. So if your taxpayer is single, then the amount of money they can make is $9,500 and they would not have to file a tax return. If your taxpayers are married filing jointly, they each get a $3,700 personal exemption and a standard deduction of $11,600. That would be a total of $19,000 before they would have to file a tax return. If your taxpayers are elderly, that's the terminology that the IRS uses, that means they are age 65 or older, or they are blind. They will get an additional $1,150 if they are married taxpayers. That $1,150 is added to their standard deduction for the year. If indeed your single taxpayer is elderly, again age 65 or older, or blind, that amount increases to $1,450. So your single taxpayer age 65 or older gets a larger standard deduction than your married filing joint couple does. There is no other impairment that qualifies for an additional standard deduction other than blind or age 65 and older. The definition of blind for the Internal Revenue Service is you cannot be better than 2200 in the best of your eyes. Now in the first year that a taxpayer is diagnosed as being blind by their physician, a statement of, from the physician must be included with the filing of the tax return. After that, no other statement needs to be added to future tax returns, but the declaration of the status of being blind in the best of your eyes, no better than 2200, must be in that first year tax return where that status is claimed. As a tax tip, even if you otherwise do not have to file a tax return, please make certain that there has been no withholding paid in or that your senior is not entitled to some type of credit because in order to get any withholding that has previously been paid in, 
perhaps it was an estimated tax payment from a previous year, or a credit that your taxpayer is entitled to. You will have to file a tax return in order to get that refund. Your senior taxpayer may be confused about the income that they have to report. I oftentimes quote what the Internal Revenue Service says. All income is taxable unless it is exempted by statute or code. So when you are beginning with the word all income, then we're looking to see what that really means to our seniors. Oftentimes a senior will say, well, you know, I made a little bit of money, but I didn't get a W-2 for it, or I didn't get a 1099 for it. The forms W-2 and 1099 mean nothing as far as having to report income. Because if you made income, even if you did not get those forms, it is still taxable income. Now, all income can be reduced by statutory exempted amounts. And the one most frequently seniors will deal with, we'll talk about shortly. The types of income they are familiar with are W-2 wages. And sometimes our seniors will have part-time jobs. My husband teases me about, when are you going to go down to Walmart and become a greeter? Because I always think I can do a better job of it than the person that currently has that job. Some of our seniors have part-time jobs. Dividends and interest income are taxable income to our seniors. And oftentimes, when they retire from their job or when they're dismissed from their job, they will draw unemployment compensation. That is taxable income. And when in prior years some of that unemployment compensation has been exempted from income, in 2011 it is fully taxable income. But wait a minute. You don't often have to have a W-2 or a 1099 to have taxable income. Many of our seniors will babysit and be compensated for it. They'll neighborhood house sit when one of their neighbors is away. Perhaps they'll pet sit and get compensation. Some seniors will mow lawns or do gardening for compensation. And what we're seeing more and more frequently today is our seniors making arts and crafts and going to trade shows or going to craft sales and selling those items. That is all taxable income. And strangely enough, it's not just subject to federal income tax, but if this is income that is generated by your self-employment, that means the senior will also have to pay self-employment tax. That self-employment tax is twice Social Security because they are now their own employers. Well, what about Social Security? Seniors, once they start to draw Social Security, are a little confused about having to pay Social Security. They're also confused about that self-employment tax. Well, they will continue to pay into the Social Security system as long as they have what is called earned income. Now, when they receive their Social Security, some of that money that they receive from Social Security may very well be taxable income. There is a limitation of income that can be earned by married filing joint couples and that income is $32,000 before any of their Social Security is taxable income. For a single individual, they can make $25,000 before their Social Security is taxable. The more income they earn, the greater percentage of their Social Security will be taxable income. 
Now the actual calculation for that becomes a little bit more difficult. You take all the income of the taxpayer or taxpayers, and to that you add one half of their Social Security benefits. And that's why for more of our seniors than ever before, our seniors will pay taxes on some of their Social Security. Even those seniors who have invested in investments that pay tax-free interest. The tax-free interest is not subject to federal income tax. However, the tax-free interest they earn is part of that calculation of how much of their Social Security is taxable income. And up to 85% of that Social Security, based upon the total income of the taxpayer, can be taxable for federal income tax purposes. Now that does not mean if your taxpayer got Social Security of $10,000 this year that $8,500 of it is going to be taxable to the IRS. What that means is their bracket is not 85%, but based upon their total income, they may have an additional $8,500 that is taxable at the overall rate of the taxpayer based upon their total income. It's one of the issues that will be very confusing to your senior taxpayer. One of the things I like to talk about with my senior taxpayers is their gambling income. It is the pastime of seniors in 2011 and 2012. It can radically change the taxability of income for your seniors. The income from gambling is reported on page one of the tax form 1040. Big on page one, it will then increase what's known as the adjusted gross income of your taxpayer. Again, the increase in how much of your Social Security is taxable is based upon the income of your senior. If that income is increased by gambling income, then likely as not, the amount of the Social Security your taxpayer receives, how much of it will be taxable, will be increased. But they had losses too. Well, losses are not netted against gambling winnings on page one. The losses are reported over on Schedule A, which is itemized deductions. Now, sometimes the gambling losses do not exceed the standard deduction. When that happens, those gambling losses are simply non-deductible. In order to substantiate, those gambling losses, oftentimes your seniors will have the casino print off a statement of their winnings and losses for the year. This is a double-edged sword. They have played with their player's card and the casino has printed off how much they won and how much they lost. Well, their gambling winnings when it goes over a certain amount, and normally that's about $1,500 on a slot machine, the senior will receive what is called a W-2G, requiring the reporting of those winnings. But most of our seniors will only want to report those winnings, those reported on a W-2G. If they want to use that statement from the casino to report their losses on Schedule A, all the other winnings, not just the W-2G reportable winnings, will be reported. So you need to pick up all income is taxable income unless it is exempted by statute or code, not just those W-2G reportable earnings. Now, itemizing deductions versus the standard deduction is always problematic for our seniors. My client, Ms. Lila, 
brings in to me every year all of her receipts for her pharmacy purchases, her visits to the doctor, her visits to the dentist. Miss Lila is a single taxpayer and she's going to get a standard deduction of $5,800. That's what the government is going to give her without any substantiation for any of her deductions. Miss Lila has a home and she pays some real estate taxes. She makes some charitable contributions each year, but she has a hard time getting over that standard deduction of $5,800. Miss Lila doesn't like that. She tells me every year, you mean to tell me I make these contributions to the church? I pay my real estate taxes and I don't get to deduct them? No, Miss Lila, because they only add up to $4,700. And the government is going to give you $5,800. We'd be better off to take what the government gives us than what your deductions are. So we came up with a plan for Miss Lila. Miss Lila doesn't make her charitable contributions every year. She doubles up in one year. Doubling up in one year on both her charitable contributions and her real estate taxes, instead of losing the $4,700, she turns around and she gets $9,400 in one year and takes the standard deduction 5800 in the odd year. Many of our taxpayers who are of that senior status today won't understand the term bunching deductions. What they understand is one year will go long form, the next year will go the short form. Now this is problematic for our seniors and their return preparers because the best thing then they will do is have to adjust any estimated tax payment, which we'll talk about shortly. When do we have to file our tax return for 2011? April the 17th of 2012 is the filing deadline date for our 2011 tax returns. Now, everyone's always accustomed to April 15th, but April 15th falls on a Sunday in 2012, and then on Monday, which would be the normal due date, we have something called Emancipation Day in Washington, D.C. Since that is a federal holiday then in Washington, D.C., it pushes the filing deadline date to April the 17th. If for any reason our senior cannot file, their tax return by April the 17th, then they are afforded an automatic six-month extension of time to file until October the 15th of 2012. In order to do that, a Form 4868 must either be filed by paper or filed electronically for your taxpayer. Now, one of the things that is a little confusing about this automatic extension of time to file. Please be aware for your senior, this is an extension of time to file. It is not an extension of time to pay their taxes. Their taxes for 2011 are due on April the 17th of 2012. And in order to avoid penalty and interest, must be paid in with that form 4868. It is not an extension of time to pay the tax. Many of our seniors in 2011 lost a spouse during 2011. The question always will come up, how do I file my taxes this year? If in 2011 your senior lost their spouse and they did not remarry during 2011, then they can continue to file married filing joint return with the deceased spouse for 2011. 
the date of death of that deceased spouse will be shown on the tax return. However, if your senior whose spouse died in 2011 remarries, the rules change. The deceased spouse for 2011 will file as married filing separately, but your senior who remains alive and remarried will file married filing jointly or married filing separately with their new spouse. They cannot file married filing jointly with their deceased spouse if they remarried by December 31st of 2011. If they did not remarry but file the joint return with the deceased spouse, then they will sign the return as the taxpayer's spouse or personal representative. If there is a refund on that tax return for the year, they will be also required to submit a Form 1310 to request the deceased taxpayer's refund. It is attached to the return and the taxpayers can still file electronically. If they have remarried, the senior who is deceased will have a Form 1310 in the return and the spouse that remained will sign the return as the personal representative and file the Form 1310 attaching it to the tax return of the deceased spouse. If your name or address changes during the year, this is problematic for our seniors who remarry. You must file the tax return for that year based on the name which is currently on file with the Social Security Administration. If you have remarried, your senior should be advised to change their name with the Social Security Administration first and then file an address change with the Internal Revenue Service using Form 8822. You must file a tax return using the name that is on file with the Social Security Administration. In the world of tax planning for seniors, estimated tax payments are very important particularly in those years that you bunch those itemized deductions, your seniors will pay less in tax than in a year that they took the standard deduction. So estimated tax payments will have to be watched very carefully for your seniors. We certainly want to avoid paying penalty. I can guarantee you seniors may not be happy about paying federal income tax but they are certainly not happy about paying any penalty or interest. Many of our seniors will be making withdrawals from their individual retirement accounts and that will be taxable income unless those IRA withdrawals are from a Roth IRA. So we will always want to be aware of how much our senior plans to withdraw from their IRAs and what type of IRAs there are. What we certainly don't want to do is leave our taxpayers money on the table. Now what does Bianna mean by that? Here I have Miss Lila. We're preparing our tax return for her for 2011 and we suddenly discover that Miss Lila has negative income. Her bunching of deductions for the year totally wiped out her income and then she had her personal exemption. So we have negative taxable income of $4,000. Miss Lila is thrilled because she doesn't pay any federal income tax for the year. But I know I didn't do my job. You see, I should have had Miss Lila in my office before the end of 2011, calculated what her taxable income would be, and once discovering she had a negative 
$4,000. I should have talked to Miss Lila about pulling money out of her traditional IRA because she could have had $4,000 more in income and not paid one red cent of tax on it. Now wait a minute. As a tax planner, I know I've got a little other calculation I have to make on that. Because remember, Miss Lila's total income will affect how much of her Social Security is taxable income. So I have to make certain that my attempt to withdraw enough money out of her IRA to take her to taxable income of zero does not then result in calculating more of her Social Security being taxable and then resulting in taxable income for her for the year. It is a secondary calculation and your tax professional will be able to help your senior make that calculation, determine how much out of that IRA she should take out. Now Miss Lila is going to tell me, oh Vianna, I don't need the money. I don't need to take any money out of my IRA. Miss Lila, it's not that you need the money. It's that this is our opportunity to take that money out without any federal income tax on it. We can put that money into another account for you for you to use later on, but we don't want to miss the opportunity of taking the money out and not having to pay taxes on it. Seniors and identity theft. It is one of the issues that in 2012 is forefront for our seniors. We need to make certain that they are aware of issues that may compromise their identity. The Internal Revenue Service has certainly posted on their website some issues of identity theft that they want our seniors to be aware of, and we need to convey that to our seniors. The IRS does not initiate email to taxpayers. Many of our seniors are using email today, particularly to talk to their grandchildren, but if they get an email from someone pretending to be the Internal Revenue Service, they should be absolutely aware that this is nothing but a phishing scheme and it needs to be reported to the Internal Revenue Service at a special website they've set up, phishing at irs.gov. Now, how do these identity thieves get our seniors information? If our senior has lost or had their wallet or purse stolen, sometimes they will pose as needing your personal information with a phone call for some reason. They will also look through their trash. I advise all of my seniors to shred any personal documents whatsoever. Sometimes our seniors will be on the internet and they will find themselves on an unsecured internet site. Their identity is now compromised. Sometimes there are websites claiming to be the Internal Revenue Service and our seniors should always be cautioned to use secure websites. It's interesting that when you are on the internet, it is not just thieves in the United States we have to be worried about, but the internet is worldwide and someone from China, someone from Ethiopia, someone from England could be the thief that is after your senior's identity. If their identity is stolen, they should notify the Internal Revenue Service Oftentimes, when your senior will file a tax return, they'll be notified another return has already been filed for them. That is a very good indication that someone has stolen their Social Security number. There is a special telephone number that the IRS offers. It's called the Protection Specialized Unit. It is 800-908-4490. That is where the senior's identity theft should be reported.
The Internal Revenue Service has instigated a new program this year. It is called an IPPIN, and you would check that box on the Form 1040 to notify the Internal Revenue Service and write in the number that they have given you to notify them that there is an identity theft. If your senior is continuing to work, they should always give their Social Security card to their employer so that they can record their Social Security number. Do not carry your Social Security card with you just in case there is a theft of your wallet or your purse. Keep it in a secure place other than your wallet or purse. Seniors should watch for scams. They are particularly vulnerable to those scams. And the IRS is listed on their website, the ones that our seniors should be most aware of. First of all, fictitious claims for refunds or refunds based upon excess Social Security benefits. Our seniors are drawing those Social Security benefits, and they would be susceptible to such a scam. Claims that the Treasury has a Form 1080, which can be used to transfer funds from Social Security to the IRS, enabling a payout from the IRS. Seniors should be aware there is no Form 1080 that the IRS recognizes. Unfamiliar for-profit tax services teaming up with local churches, watch that for your seniors. Homemade flyers and brochures implying credits for refunds are available without proof of eligibility. Offers of free money with no documentation required. Promises of refunds for low income, no document tax returns. And claims for the expired economic recovery credit program or recovery rebate credit. And advice on claiming the earned income tax credit based upon exaggerated reports of self-employment income. Our seniors have the time to talk with friends, relatives. They have the time to hear about how taxpayers have not filed tax returns or have gotten such credits as these. Seniors are vulnerable to hearing about these items. Please make certain that your taxpayer understands that if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Social Security refunds or rebates have been the bait used by con artists for years. They will remember their mother telling them, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Oftentimes we have seniors that have fallen victim to broker-dealer impropriety, and tax time is the excellent time to review all financial matters with your senior. Full financial resources should be disclosed and the performance of investments should be reviewed. This is the time that you should also, as the CSA, touch base with the senior's broker-dealer to make certain that that senior's investments are on track. Please be careful watching for things such as margin interest, large losses in the senior's accounts. That would be a heads up that you need to have a serious upfront conversation with that broker dealer. Now, who can you get to prepare that senior's tax return? Or who would your senior go to? Attorneys, certified public accountants, and enrolled agents are familiar terms for your senior. We have a new credential. It's called a Registered Tax Return Preparer. The Internal Revenue Service in 2011 opened up a testing procedure for registered tax return preparers. These are individuals who in the past did not have the credentials of being an attorney, a certified public accountant, or an enrolled agent. 
the Internal Revenue Service is cautioning taxpayers to look for tax professionals who do have credentials. All attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, and registered tax return preparers should have what is called a P10, a Practitioner Taxpayer Identification Number. And that number should be readily on the tax returns of your seniors or any other taxpayer. Well, who do I choose and how much do I pay these people? There is a difference in return preparers, and it comes not in return preparation, but it comes in the area of what happens after that tax return is filed. Attorneys, certified public accountants, and enrolled agents prepare and represent at the Internal Revenue Service before all levels of the IRS, examination, collection, and appeals. Registered tax return preparers prepare and represent only at the initial examination level of a tax return and only if they have prepared the return, where attorneys, CPAs, and enrolled agents do not have to prepare the return in order to represent for it. You usually get what you pay for. CPAs, attorneys, and enrolled agents should be well versed in the issues of taxation that your senior is involved in. You want to make certain whoever you select to prepare that senior's tax return, they have the knowledge and the experience that you're looking for. And always, always, always ask in advance what that fee is going to be. But what if you don't want to pay to have your tax return prepared? The Internal Revenue Service opened free file on January 17th of 2012. This is for taxpayers with adjusted gross income of 57000 or less. And you can go to www.irs.gov slash free file to get there. E-file in free file is free. Other assistance your senior can go to, volunteer income tax assistance, go to a VITA site in their local area. There's tax counseling for the elderly. And free file kiosk. There are over 200 nationwide where taxpayers can go in, prepare their own tax return, and e-file for no cost right there. Walmart stores. H&R Block and Jackson Hewitt will assist for free taxpayers, but only if they're filing a 1040 EZ, which is a much less involved tax return than the Form 1040. Many of our seniors will not be able to file a 1040 EZ. If our senior needs their refund quickly, the best way to do it is e-file their tax return. That means they will electronically file their tax return. It's estimated that about 10 days before they will receive their refund. And it can be deposited into up to three different bank accounts. If your senior is working and wants to continue to make an IRA contribution, they could have their refund from their tax return automatically deposited into their IRA account, or their savings account at the bank, or their checking account at the bank. For our seniors who are married, they must have a joint checking account to have their jointly filed refund deposited. If they want to track their refund, IRS has a wonderful website for that. It's called Where's My Refund? You go online to www.irs.gov and check on that refund 24-7. Three to four weeks after you file the tax return, use Where's My Refund. They will ask you for your social security number, your filing status, were you married or were you single, 
and what refund amount you are anticipating, and it will tell you the status of your refund. If after you file your tax return you need help, you go to the National Taxpayer Advocate Service. The Taxpayer Advocate Service has a taxpayer advocate in every location in the United States, major city. You can go to irs.gov and find the direct phone number. You can only take your case to the Taxpayer Advocate Service if you have not received your refund and that's causing you a financial difficulty. You have an immediate threat of adverse action from the Internal Revenue Service and you have repeatedly tried to contact the IRS. I cannot say enough about the National Taxpayer Advocate Service. They are an excellent source of help for your senior. Contact TAS or the Taxpayer Advocate Service if this is an individual tax matter the phone number 800-829-1040, or they also have it for the hearing impaired with 800-829-4059. Taxpayer Advocate Service is open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the evening. As I stated before, the one thing that our taxpayer doesn't want to pay is any kind of penalty, and they are quite severe. If they do not file their tax return timely, that would normally be April the 15th, and they have not gotten an extension, there is a 5% penalty each month, up to 25% for what your taxpayer owes. Paying late, there's a half a percent each month, up to 25%, and a monthly interest rate that is set by the Internal Revenue Service. Other penalties can be negligence penalties, that's for not filing the correct amounts, a substantial understatement of tax if your senior does not report all of their income. If they are involved in a tax shelter, they are required to report reportable transactions and understatements of income or erroneous credits can result in other substantial penalties. Now the really nasty ones come in with failure to file, tax evasion, and fraud because these carry criminal penalties. You can't go to jail if you owe the IRS, but if your senior should have filed a tax return and didn't, that is a criminal offense, and they can go to jail for failure to file a tax return. I've never seen a senior who wanted to spend their golden days of retirement in prison. This is not an option for our taxpayers. Again, we want to talk about estimated tax payments because penalties can be assessed for failure to pay taxes during the year. You don't just suddenly owe tax on April 15th. We have a pay-as-you-go system or a pay-as-you-earn-the-income system. So the Internal Revenue Service expects our senior clients to pay quarterly estimated tax payments. The safe harbor is always to make the quarterly estimated tax payments for 2012 equal to the amount that was owed in 2011. Again, this becomes a little bit more problematic for our seniors who do bunch those deductions. The dates of estimated tax payments are a little confusing for our seniors. The first one is due April 17th of 2012 for 2012. Two months later, June 15th, the second quarter estimated tax payment is due. Then September 15th, and then January 15th of 2013 is the fourth quarter estimated tax payment. Please make certain that when your senior reports those estimated tax payments to their return preparer, that they include January 15th of 2013 or 
of 2012 for this last year. That is always problematic because the senior looks at the date and thinks that's an estimated tax payment for that year, not the previous year. On your senior's 1040 tax return, on page 2, at the bottom where they sign the return, there is a check the box called a third party designee. Now that is for the preparer of the return, it's for your senior's daughter or son, because it can give information that third party designee can communicate with the IRS about missing information on the tax return. They can call the IRS about processing the return or a refund. It can give them copies of IRS notices upon a request. And it can respond to certain IRS notices, math errors, and processing if that third party designee is noted on page 2 of the Form 1040. Now this is not a power of attorney. That is requiring a Form 48, pardon me, 2848 that you can get at irs.gov. It is not a power of attorney to check that third party designee. The power of attorney, however, goes further than that third party designee. It allows the representative to represent the senior at all administrative levels of the IRS. It will allow that power of attorney to talk with the IRS directly for the senior. Now, before all administrative levels will require that that power of attorney, if it's the return preparer, be an attorney, a CPA, or an enrolled agent. The new registered tax return preparer can only represent at the initial examination level and only if they prepared the return. There is a form that is very important that every CSA has filed with the Internal Revenue Service. It is a Form 8821. It's an authorization to disclose. What that authorization to disclose does, it allows the CSA to get a copy of any IRS correspondence that is sent to your senior. The Form 8821 can be filed with the tax return whether the return is filed by paper or electronically. It will avoid taxpayer confusion. Why I say that is your senior is going to receive the same correspondence that you, the CSA, is going to get. That means you pick up the phone and call that senior. If it is a notice that that senior owes more in federal income tax, then rather than the senior just pay it, you know about it and you're going to do the investigation, do the inquiry as to why the IRS believes your senior owes more money. It will keep you intimately involved in your senior's relationship with the Internal Revenue Service. How long does your senior have to keep records? Most of them probably have them dating back to 1947. They only have to keep them three years from the date of the filing of the tax return or April 15th. If they file in March or February, then the date they have to keep those records for three years is from April the 15th. It's whichever date is later. Now if your senior has managed in any year to understate their income by 25% or more, they need to keep six years of records. Fraudulent returns do not start the statute of limitations running, and if the Internal Revenue Service has ever filed a substitute for return, that is an SFR, they do not start the statute of limitations running for your taxpayer. It requires the filing by your taxpayer of a tax return to start the statute of limitations running. If your taxpayer owes the Internal Revenue Service, what should they do? Without question, they should pay it. 
that gets them out of the system of the Internal Revenue Service. Pay that tax. But if they don't have the money to pay the tax, they should borrow the money. If they have a home and can make a home equity loan, then that home equity loan should be used to pay the tax. That will give them an additional deduction on their tax return of the mortgage interest. If they cannot borrow the money, they can go to the Internal Revenue Service and request an installment agreement. If your taxpayer is totally unable to pay this tax, there are some other options that a tax professional should be involved in to help your senior. One is to file an offer in compromise. One is to get temporarily uncollectible that status obtained for your taxpayer. But at that point in time, a trained tax professional in the matters of collection before the Internal Revenue Service should be engaged to help your senior. Never, never, ever should a senior ignore the Internal Revenue Service, either any communication from them or owe the IRS and ignore communications. The Internal Revenue Service has a vast arsenal of weapons to use against seniors, including liens and levies on their bank account, on their property, and on their Social Security. Any federal payment that your senior is receiving, whether it be a VA pension, Social Security, or other amounts from the federal government, can be leaned and levied upon if they owe the Internal Revenue Service. They can also seize your property, ruin your credit, and cause your insurance rates to increase. Again, never ever ignore communications from the IRS. How long can the IRS do this? They have 10 long years to collect from your taxpayer. Who can help you? Attorneys, certified public accountants, and enrolled agents. But make certain your tax professional has the knowledge and the skill to represent you. Senior taxpayers are, thank goodness, among the most compliant taxpayers in the country. They'll pay a bill from the IRS without question, even when it's not owed. That's why you as the CSA need to be involved with the Form 8821. They need our assistance to make certain that the IRS does not abuse seniors. IRS notices are not always correct. CSAs, you must ensure seniors file and pay their taxes. If needed, secure a tax professional for assistance and stay informed on the tax situation of the senior through the Form 8821. CSAs, and I am proud to tell you that Vianna Whitlock is a certified senior advisor. We are the key to assisting seniors work with their tax professional. Refer seniors to qualified tax professionals and give confidence to seniors that they have met their obligation to their government. CSR, CSAs are important to seniors. I want to thank you today for your time. I know it's a busy time for you. I am giving you my contact information. I have recently relocated to Reno, Nevada. I have a web address and my 800 number for you. Again, I want to thank you today. I want to thank Erica for her unbelievable expertise and her knowledge and her ability to make this happen today. She will refer any of the questions that you may have to me and I will promptly respond to you. Again, thank you. Do all you can to help your seniors. They are dependent upon you.